join me in introducing Sam Blanchi the fourth. That's a hard one to live up to. Thanks. Uh, this is amazing. I'm so excited to be here. Um, the talk so far have far exceeded, I think, any of our expectations. And I hope to do a little bit to help push this along. So let's, before we get into this, let's take a moment, let's then out, look at this Michigan picturesque uh, sunset here. Give a little breath in. Exhale through the mouth. Hey, I needed that more than you. <laughs> um, there's going to be three bells. That <laughs> guy's way cooler than I'll ever be. I'm excited about this idea, this idea of our diverse interests. This room's microcosm represents the disintegration of the mainstream, not just in the media world. It's, it's a, a, a vast terrain of ideas, technologists, designers, musicians, creatives. Um, we're all able to, as the studio has stated, has stated uh, focus on our interests, focus on our passions. And the focus of this energy is going to create the laser beam that's going to change the world. So why am I here? What can I offer possibly? I'm not a PhD. I'm not even, I don't have a master's in anything. But what I can offer is my story and my experience as a graduate of this university um, and what I've done with mostly with a, a creative, a, an incredible amount of creative people. Uh, for which I take no, no ownership of. It's a truly a collaboration. So a long time ago in a dorm room, um, Cousins Hall on the hill, I had the idea to start a record label. And now a record label, if you can remember those back in the day, uh, was a company that put together albums uh, by artists, helped distribute them to a bigger audience. Uh, and what I wanted to do was create something that was more interesting and more dynamic as a brand. It really married my interest. Um, and ghostly came to me. It was, a, it was a word I kept seeing. It was in The Great Gatsby. Uh, the word just kept feeling right to me. And so I wanted to sort of tie together these ideas that I loved in this thing called ghostly. So maybe I'm here as the entrepreneur, but I want to kind of throw that word away. I think it's exclusive. I think the idea here is that all of us are entrepreneurs. All of us are enterprising in our fields. And that's what brings us together. Uh, so this idea is the ecstatic fringe. And the static fringe is all of us and our unique energies and what's going to create the future. Um, that's the true definition. It's the world is being tied together by these ideas. So the static fringe, I'm going to throw myself in that bucket. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not a designer. Uh, I don't make music. I realized that early that was not my passion and not my calling. I work with people I love and that I care about and offer music to people that I think want to receive it. Uh, the static fringe are also fans. And I don't call them demographics, I don't call them customers or consumers. I think of them as people. People that make ghostly shirts for their dogs, or snack fringe, they are wanted. People that get ghostly tattoos on their arms are hardcore snack fringers. Uh, and they send you low res pictures so you can't use them in slideshows. That's, that's true, true devotion. Even girls and guys who use stickers inappropriately, they want more of that. That's good. Uh, so I'm going to put them in there too. Them is the fans, them the enthusiasts. All of us are fans of something. We all have a stake in that. And so I'm going to put the fans, all of us together. It's, it's, the, it's the group. The aesthetic fringe is the new mainstream. It's the mainstream that's been disseminated. Uh, so what are we going to do? This, this group, this, this small microcosm that's happening across the world. There's more TEDx events than there are days in the year. And these to me are, are all ecstatic fringers finding their voice. So back to Ghostly, because it's fun to talk about. Uh, Ghostly is this idea that the creation of a Midwestern brand can change the world in a very, very small way. It's not health media. It's not all these great ideas. It's my little contribution to the world landscape. And again, it's the sum of parts. You've got design, you've got music, you've got business. These are all things I care about deeply. Ghostly is also a resource. Uh, it's not as important that people can't derive value from it, both internally and externally. And Ghostly is a symbol of the regional spirit. Um, I wanted to say, and we all wanted to say, that Ghostly can be started anywhere, any college town, any small town. You don't have to be in the coast. You can be in the Midwest. And there's so much talent to be found in any city, and just understood and, and um, established that that's what it's about. So I entered Matthew Deer. This is the dorm room, the cousins. I met Matthew my first week of school. I was a wayward, lovesick freshman, LSNA. I uh, didn't know what I wanted to do. 
was not a crazy um, scholar, was not an athlete, so where do you put yourself? Uh, and he's, uh, he's playing at his house party uh, my first week of school, he's DJing, and playing this great techno music that I started getting interested in. And we had a moment, and I said, let's, let's meet, let's put something together. He wanted to put records out, I wanted to start a label, it's warm. And then we entered Dave Shaman. Dave Shaman is an Ann Arbor prodigal son. He uh, started, he was a pioneer, total ecstatic fringer. I mean, band geek, science geek, becomes one of the best DJs I've ever seen in my entire life. Amazing selection, amazing scratching. Uh, a ladies' man, just totally incredible guy. <laughs> His nickname was Disco D. And he, he showed me that you could do anything from anywhere. He had a record label. He had gigs that he couldn't even get into as a 17-year-old. As a he had to go in the back door to DJ. Uh, so we started. Matthew's the talent, Dave is the inspiration. I'm just there for a ride, and we start making records. Uh, and what happens is it's spread, and each of these little dots is the energy that was coming towards us. We have photographers, we have designers, we have uh, you know all sorts of people from the business school helping out in a small way, and the, the ball has started going. So more records come out, more demos come in, slowly starts to fill up my dorm room, and we get an office. And then we started making stuff. We realized you know, people don't want just the music, they want the entire experience. Started touring, you know, going regionally. That's sort of the way that you know, the classic American rock dream starts. And even Matthew starts picking up bigger venues, Coachella, uh, around the world. I even got to speak on funny summits with you know, guys with funny sunglasses and pretend I was a serious speaker for a minute. Uh, and so some press came in, and it feels good. It's about four or five years in, we're rolling, can't do anything wrong. And then something funny happens. Uh, I think this happens for everybody when they start doing something, whether it's playing the violin or working on a thesis. It gets easier and easier, and then you hit the dip. A dip is a Seth Godin word, uh, and it means pretty much what I just said, and it applies to everybody in this room on a personal level and a professional level. And so our dip uh, is pretty well documented in the annals of business history. Uh, the CD started going the way of the floppy disk and the, uh, <clears throat> the three inch disk and the laser disk as we saw earlier. Uh, it just wasn't happening. We saw it coming, but it fell faster than we expected. And also innovation wise and, and musically, we wanted to try new things, not just DJ, not just play out records. Matthew Deere picks up a microphone. I mean, he was raised on country music in Texas before I moved to Ann Arbor, and he felt that was a natural progression. So we're doing our first show, it's 2004, we're in New York City. We're really pumped, you know, we're probably 23, 4, in that range. And we figure, you know, we can do no wrong. We're just pushing ahead, we're making new things happen. And so we realize the next day, we're looking at uh, the reviews online and whatnot, and uh, I can paraphrase them. Uh, I was shocked and disappointed, says the media. Matthew Deere wasted my time. Uh, when he picked up a guitar, I decided that was a sign for me to leave. So all of a sudden, you had this very pithy but very real crash to our sort of esteem. Uh, I'm sure that happens with everybody in their own fields. Um, as the industry started to slide, as we started losing sort of this momentum that we had thought we had inherently, we even had our little logo and mantra that we say in our meetings, and it's death is nothing to fear, which is a little heavy-handed, but it was this sort of rally cry that we weren't going to let ourselves cave in. Uh, and that's something even worse happens, and, and probably the worst thing that's ever happened to me and, and uh, my friends. And we lost our inspiration. We lost Dave. And, you know, Dave uh, took his life in 2007, and it really changed the dynamics of, of what we thought we were doing, philosophies. I always expected Dave and I to be one day old men in a nursing home talking about our travels and how much cool things we've done. And, and I realized that I could be gone in a second. And so I re in the urgency. Uh, I knew Dave wanted us to continue going. He wanted us to take it further for him. Um, but the dip still looms. The dip, the dip is like standing in front of a mountainside and looking at it just there. You can't really see where you're supposed to go. It's a fog. And so the only out of a fog is to reassess. And so I, I found out about vision and looking into vision more. Because you just do things. You know, why do we do these things? We just go into them. We want to make something happen. And then you realize you have to find that rooting, like uh, the gentleman has talked about. Do your behaviors match your core values? Why are we doing this? What did Dave want when he started DJ? So we got out by asking around. And once again, resourcing, re cool resourcing the local community. Obviously looking to Zingerman's, which is you know, obviously a famous restaurant, 
but also a, a model of what business can be when founded on vision, both at the higher level and on the employees. And so I realized what they had told us is that vision leads and strategy follows. So once you know where you're going, where you want to be, what social media do you use and what stock of business card you use, that's all tactics. It's what, where you're going that matters. And so we realized that curation was what we were doing. We weren't putting out CDs. We were narrowing the world of media, just like health media on a much more robust and grandiose scale. Our, our little idea was to take music and to filter it down to, to an audience that really wants to enjoy it. And so this idea spread throughout the organization. We started a, a pop-up shop in Berlin, bringing in our favorite products of our own and other people's. Uh, we started playing with the formats of the USB key at this design store, um, getting back on the road, bringing different artists in, not just our own, to share. Even doing iPhone apps, where we're curating music based on mood. And then something uh, so simple but so revelatory happens. Matt's playing. He continues on with his vision of performing as a band. And in London, on his tour, uh, a girl and her boyfriend walk up to him, probably about 16, 17. And she hands him a plastic flower, and she says, Matt, my father has passed, and it was a long and, and protracted battle, and I listen to your album every day, and it got me through this hard time. And I think that, that something about that brought back Dave, and it brought back how music helped us through all this, and how it helps all of us through our energy, and it, it, it sort of validated the idea that vision truly leads. So let's bring this back. Uh, we can talk about ghostly all day, but it's, you know, this is what's more important. What's this room, what's this community, what's the world stage, how can we bring this together? Now I look at the region, I think Michigan uh, in general is, is the ultimate lesson in dip endurance. And you're gonna dip all the way up, that scale keeps going up and dipping up and dipping. Uh, and Michigan's a great example of where we all are, what we're doing. So why here? This is Detroit, circa 1910. The Paris of the Midwest, teeming with energy, uh, industrial, um, harnessing all this power. And the ultimate resource we have is a natural resource, the resource we take for granted. Trees, water, pretty awesome. So I, I think the, the first society fringe in the mid to late 1800s uh, are the loggers, the timbermen. This is, this, is the, this is the power, this is the harnessing of the resources. These are the entrepreneurs, this is the ecstatic French. Uh, they're creating new resources by traveling not only timber and building a lot of the country, but also traveling water with the means of construction. And it's with these guys and gals that we find um, our first major <coughs> success. Obviously, success breeds success. And so logging turns to chemicals, and chemicals turns to engineering. And we start bringing in the best folks around the, around the country. Logging tips and dips at the late 1890s. We went from number one in exports to number 16. We over, we over depleted. And every upper hand, pun intended, loses its upper hand at some point. <laughs> and so the auto industry happens, and the factory idea is born, the assembly line. And this transfers down to media, and obviously the Motown sound, Barry Gordy. This visionary leadership shared by Ford and the pioneers that, that helped make Michigan what it was, travels to media. And they take the same factory approach and change the world, change racial boundaries with this sound just from here. And obviously, the idea of machines, the idea of this, the auto plan, uh, coupled with soul music, creates techno. And that's the, that's the kernel of interest that got me into, into music. So how do we go from here? How do we get from, from this, this grandeur into this dip? This became the sort of symbol of Detroit, the symbol of the recession, Time Magazine the ruins, uh, the pride, and the pain. You know, these things are hardly images, and they, they, they represent an internal change, this mental change that not only the country, especially this region, uh, has, has to face. So I think one of our greatest resources now is fear. Um, getting a paper in on time, uh, delivering, you know, making sure your room is clean when your mom visits your dorm. Uh, these are very motivating factors. For me, getting ghostly up off the ground before I graduated, just so I can make it a real a livelihood, it's a healthy thing. And we have this fear that if we don't recoup, if we don't get out of the dip, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen for all of us. Uh, and I, I, I save a lot of IMs from Dave. Dave and I answer message a lot. And he had these really great adages that I, I luckily I was able to save. And this one kind of came back to me. 
The scariest thing in the world to me is not dying. It's a split second before I die thinking, oh shit, I wish I had done, instead of just, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> and Dave had a way with words, as you can tell. And he's a charmer, and he's eccentric, and he was brilliant. And I love this. As it's, so, it's so colloquial, it's so casual, but it, it, just, it summarizes what we all want to do. It's not frequent flyer miles. It's, it's uh, the real things that we really care about. So we need to regroup. Us in a room, business leaders, even government, we're regrouping. We're taking our resources and we're bringing them back together. So why here? You know, how, how did 40 students do this without a paycheck? How did 600 people try to get into this room? People want it. People are hungry for knowledge. And it's not the mainstream. It's not just getting fed an idea of this is the Magna Carta from top. Government's infallible. We're looking for our own inspiration, looking for ideals within the community. And so I think there's this chance of rebirth, both for the community and for uh, the world at large. We're reassessing our values, and we're looking internally for these values. So do you realize, tying in the theme of this summit, that we are the beacons? Just as Go Sleep, My Little Lighthouse, on my toy train set mountain, we are the beacons, everyone in this room, what we're creating is the future by our understanding of our passions and our core values. If you realize we are the ecstatic fringe, we are the, the, the mighty is here, it's, the, the stage is set, we have to walk up to it and stay our case. And do you realize, maybe we weren't around in the 1910s for the first great revolution of this the state and city, but we're in 2010, and so I congratulate you on being part of what's going to be the next great change. Thanks.